I want to welcome everybody to the IR Training Pathways webinar, uh, The Past, Present, and Future Models for Interventional Radiology Education. Uh, my name is Kyle Cooper. I'm the chair of the Training Pathways Committee, which is a subset of the resident and fellow section of SIR. And um, our committee, the Training Pathways Committee, is made up of myself and the residents and medical students that you see here that do all the work. Um, Dr. Warren Swee is our newly accepted um, faculty advisor for the group. Uh, he works in Florida, and he's going to be talking here shortly as well. And then the RFS faculty member, member is Dr. Vatican Cherry, whom I'm sure most of you already know in some manner speaking. Now, the Training Pathways Committee uh, has several goals, and our overarching goal is the uh, promotion uh, promoting creation of IR training programs nationally that place an emphasis on increased clinical exposure and clinically focused IR education. Uh, we um, attempt to assist in the development of the new IR-DR dual certificate in whatever way possible, and we seek to maintain an actively updated database of the opportunities available at each institution. So we rely on all of you, uh, the members of the RFS, medical students, program coordinators, and program directors to help us keep this database up to date. And it's in the hands of medical students already. They use it to determine where they're going to be applying. So if you want me to email you this link so you can make sure your program is adequately represented, then there's my email address. Go ahead and send me an email, and I'll get that out to you, because obviously you don't have time to write it all down now. Now, this is a busy slide, um, and I'm going to break it down into each section, but basically um, what this shows is that there are four ways in which one can arrive at an uh, IR, you know, in IR training, how they can become an interventional radiologist. So the one that most people are familiar with is the traditional pathway, which is a internship in their first year. You do three years or four years of radiology, and within that you do some IR for purposes of passing your boards and then you do a fellowship at the end. Now, the direct pathway uh, includes two years of clinical training prior to radiology, then two years of radiology with a little IR mixed in. Your sixth year uh, becomes your fifth year, so your fellowship you do in your fifth year. And for this, you, uh, uh, for your sixth year, you then do radiology and a little bit of IR as well, and then you take your boards. So bear with me for a second. I'm going to mute someone. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, or two more. The clinical pathway includes an internship as your first year. You do three years of radiology, including seven months of both research and non-IR clinical rotations, um, which can include like oncology and vascular surgery, for example. In your fifth year, you do three months of DR, including MAMO and nuclear medicine for purposes of certification, and uh, nine months of IR or IR applicable rotations, uh, the so-called mini fellowship. And then for your sixth year, again, you do a fellowship. Finally, the dual certificate as it's currently um, proposed includes an internship, three years of radiology with a month of IR in each to be ready for boards. Your fifth year is mostly IR. You do another rotation in ICU for a refresher, and you do two months of diagnostic radiology. And then no longer do you have a fellowship. Your sixth year becomes a residency year in interventional radiology only. So I know that was a lot of information. And um, if any questions come up, I want you to email them to this email address, and I'm going to post that in chat as well. And uh, I will ask them to the panel at large at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, our first speaker tonight is going to be Nicole Zimmerman. Um, she's the student chair for the Medical Student Council of SIR, and she is uh, obviously a member of the Training Pathways Committee and one of my hardest workers. So, um, Nikki, I'm going to go ahead and bring up your slides, and then I'll have you take it away. Great. Thanks, Thank Kyle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I forgot to mention, she's a fourth-year medical student at SUNY Upstate. So bear with me. Before you start, I want to make sure that we've muted everybody here. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to go and let's show your slides. All right, Nikki, go ahead. 
Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Nikki Zimmerman. Um, this research project was conducted with Dr. Sanjay Mizra, Joji Vatican Cherry, and residents Alokba and Rahul Nayar. It's very preliminary data, and we're currently in the process of submitting it to a journal. So we polled 25 medical students at this past year's SIR in New Orleans, and we focused on identifying what students are looking for in the new dual certificate. Next slide. Um, so our, our first question focused on what pathway students are most interested in applying to. And you can see the overwhelming majority were interested in applying to the dual certificate. There are still a fair amount of people that were interested in applying for the traditional pathway, and we think this is twofold. First, that students that are interested in going into IR, it doesn't matter what pathway they choose, um, they're going to want to go into IR, whether it's the fellowship or a combined pathway. The second is the uncertainty related to the dual certificate, and hopefully we can help clarify some of that during this webinar. Next slide. The second question that we asked focused on how a specific pathway may affect a student's interest in applying to a given program. So we gave them a scale of one through five, one being much less likely, three being neutral, and five being much more likely. So in relation to the traditional pathway, if a program only offers the traditional pathway, the score was a 2.72, indicating that students are less likely to uh, want to apply to that program if they're interested in going into IR. In contrast, with the dual certificate, if a program offers that pathway, students are more likely with a score of 3.68 to want to apply to that pathway in comparison to another. Um, students are also interested in doing research during their residency, and this kind of parallels with the innovative nature of IR in that they want to be at the forefront developing the new procedures and new technologies that IRs are so well known for, and they want to prove the efficacy of the procedures that we're using. They're interested in longitudinal care, in following their patients in clinic as, and, peri and procedure, pre- and peri-procedural management of their patients. And they're also, also interested in more exposure to IR throughout residency rather than just waiting for fellowship to arrive. Next slide, please. Our next uh, question asks, what kind of aspects of IR specifically appeal to medical students? So how can we focus on recruiting students in the future? And the four highest are the use of technology in the medical field, the combination of both diagnostic and interventional radiology, the patient contact, as well as the procedural aspect of IR. And this kind of mimics the three core competencies of the dual certificate, which are procedures, diagnostics, and then the pre- and peri-procedural patient management. So really focusing on exactly what medical students want and what's best for the future. Next slide, please. Our last question focused on what service line students are specifically interested in. And the, the primary interest is in interventional oncology. And that's not surprising given IR's expansion into oncology therapies. Um, the second most common was vascular. And despite our increasing competition from our vascular surgery colleagues, stu students are still very interested in the vascular parts of IR. Um, so overall, the type of training program can have a really strong influence on a student's interest in IR and on specific programs. The dual certificate serves as an opportunity for IRs to invest in their own future, and given the interest and need for this type of training, we really encourage residency programs to implement this as soon as possible. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you very much, Nicole, for that presentation. I think it's clear that, I mean, there's a definite push for medical students to uh, be seeking more from the programs that they train in radiology uh, to deliver more in IR education and clinical education. So you have data that shows that, and it's excellent. So um, next up is going to be a man that needs no introduction, um, Dr. John Kaufman. Uh, he's the director of the Daughter Interventional Institute at Oregon Health Sciences University. He's the SIR Dual Certificate Task Force leader, and he's a, f a former president of SIR. So he's going to be talking to you about the dual certificate and where we're at with that. And um, Dr. Kaufman, are you still with us? That's always good. Stop sharing my desktop. All right. I may have. Are you I on? Him. Yeah, I, I got you. Dr. Kaufman, I'm sorry. Let me share the desktop with you there. I had to mute everybody in the room all at once. <laughs> so, all right, you're, you're now unmuted. And I'm back live again? You are back live, and I'm going to allow you to share your desktop now, okay? Thank you very much. So, yep. 
go, you just, go ahead and click again, the button. I'm very pleased to be here, and I think this is a great uh, subject. And uh, Nicole Zimmerman's uh, data is, I think, very interesting, and keep that in mind as we go through this uh, evening. Uh, just a few clarifications before we start that uh, the SIR has a task force that is uh, looking at some of the issues surrounding the uh, dual certificate or the IR certif IRDR certificate but is not actively engaged with the construction of that, and I'll explain sort of how this is working. Um, the, and I just did this myself, but it uh, should really be referred to as the IRDR certificate, which is what the ABR will be awarding. And the actual name of the residency is still a little bit uh, unclear and to be determined, uh, but as I'll explain, uh, a dual certification is really actually not a concept that the ACGME uh, is pursuing anymore that, that was uh, that's an artifact of the ABMS uh, sort of approval of this and just lastly sort of a disclaimer in that um, you're going to hear a, a lot of different ways to go about the IR training and the IR training in the next few years uh, those don't represent sort of the recommendations of the SIR task force um, I, I think it, this is important information to be shared but you'll understand in a few minutes that until we really understand what the the final program requirements look like, it's really hard to to know exactly what to to do here. So, if uh, Dr. Kaufman, uh, just go I'm ahead and click the slides, button. Slides, Kyle. Uh, do, do you want to show them off of your desktop, or do you want uh, me to show you know, them for why you? Uh, why don't you bring them up? So, sorry okay, about bear that. with me. No, not at all. Look the same sort of blank desktop that I am looking at. Yeah, so you while we're getting those slides, uh, let me the, the background part of this is that this has been probably a 10 or 15 year process of altering interventional radiology training to include more of the clinical components um, of uh, patient care in interventional radiology. And this has been recognized even many years before that how important that would be. And there's been a stepwise progression, starting with the clinical pathway, then the direct pathway, and then in about 2006, the application or beginning of the application to the ABMS um, for a new certificate in IR, which would elevate interventional radiology to being a primary specialist. And this really came first uh, from the ABR. The SIR brought the idea to the ABR, but really required the ABR uh, support and interest to do this. There was never any interest on the part of the SIR or the SIR leadership to have this go forward in any way other than through the ABR, and we'll sort of explain why that's so important. Um, just uh, that you see Jean LeBerge, she's one of the trustees of the ABR on this slide deck, uh, and my name in parentheses. These are our, a lot of her slides that I've modified a little bit. Um, Jean is one of the ABR trustees, and she actually sits also on the res Radiology Residency Review Committee of the ACGME and is being instrumental in sort of formulating the actual program requirements. Go to the next slide. And this is kind of an overview as, as sort of what's happened up until now. And it was in 2012 in September that the ABMS Board of Trustees uh, voted to change interventional radiology from a subspecialty of radiology to a primary specialty within medicine under the aegis of the American Board of Radiology with the certificate being in the format of certification both in comp of competency in both interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology. We, going into this process, had called it the dual certificate, and as I indicated earlier, that uh, sort of uh, articulation is probably not accurate anymore, uh, but it would be a, a certificate in both interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology uh, and competency. So this then went to the ACGME, and you're going to see here a bunch of arrows, to, and they'll help you understand what this process is. Um, went to the ACGME and, and needed to actually be approved by the ACGME uh, I think it's Board of Trustees or Board of Trustees equivalent in order to go forward. So the ABMS and the ABR work together to formulate this new certificate and get the new certificate approved. It's up to the ACGME to then agree to implement uh, the training and the implementation means first to agree to develop the program requirements and then to figure out accreditation and to figure out where all of this would live with the ACGME. So the ACGME in the early part of this year 
proved uh, this, and we can go to the next slide. The proof concept, uh, after having it go through an ad hoc committee that had to really sort of vet this, it was then sent from the ad hoc committee down to the residency review committee that was most appropriate for this, which is the radiology, uh, is where we wanted, and where during the process, on the other side, to the left of the dotted line, we had been in conversation with the radiology RC that this would be the appropriate home for this. Next slide. So uh, you can see a lot of arrows. So the RC then uh, commissioned a task force to, to write the program requirements, and that's currently what is happening uh, right now. And there's, I'll share with you the, the members of the task force shortly, but it's a, a group of individuals that have taken everything that has gone forward to this point, which was includes the descriptions and the, sort of the, the rationales uh, and information curriculum supplied to the ABMS by the ABR SIR uh, sort of committee that put this together, and they're now formulating this in a format that works for the ACGME. And next slide. It's uh, you, probably hard to see in white, but it's anticipated that for a variety of reasons, not because not within this task force's control, and this is again the RRC task force, not the SIR task force, it'll probably not be until January of 2014 that these program requirements are really in a format that will be available for public uh, viewing. At that point, um, there will be a period of several months of public commentary when anybody, literally anybody who logs into the uh, ACGME website can look at these requirements and uh, send in concerns or questions about them. Uh, all of these will have to be addressed uh, individually, so it could be a tremendous amount of work, uh, it could be a small amount, it's sort of unknown. Uh, the modifications that seem appropriate uh, will then have to take place within the program requirements. Um, they don't have to be modified according to what the comments are, but it, it, there's likely will be some very good uh, suggestions in this process. Next slide. Once this is done, uh, the radiology, the RRC for radiology will then send it back to the ACGME, um, again, the Board of Trustee levels for approval, oh, and the next slide. If it gets approved, it goes back to the RRC, and then the whole process of accreditation and figuring out how we're actually going to do this takes place. So there's a, a lot of work and a lot of steps uh, that have to take place uh, before we're going to be in a position to look at actual program requirements and begin to plan for the future. Next slide. So this is the uh, all very important people to you. These are the RRC members for diagnostic radiology. So they're all people that have a lot to do with all of your all aspects of your training. And then you can see the IR task force, which is uh, chaired by Jean Laberge. And there are some ad, some members from without the uh, who are brought in specifically to help with this. Uh, Dan Siragusa uh, and Ann Roberts both have tremendous experience. Uh, Kay Vitarini. Uh, who's been on the RC before as an ABR uh, trustee, all, all people with tremendous experience as well as some members in the RC. So this is the group that's actually working on the, pro the real details of the program requirements, and none of which we really have right now. Uh, so keep that in mind again as you hear what's other things being discussed on the call. They're not being discussed with knowledge of what's in the pipeline. Next slide. So. Certain things, though, we're pretty sure are, are not going to change because this is what the ABMS um, has agreed to and sort of what are, are necessary from the ACGME point of view. The first is that there will be a dedicated IRDR program director. Um, how this will actually work out at any institution remains to be seen, and probably each institution may approach this differently. But this will be a residency, its own residency, even though it will probably from the outside be really hard to distinguish residents in the PGY 2 four years uh, from, you know, which program they're in, whether they're in the DR, headed toward DR certificate or headed towards an IRDR certificate. They will need to have separate program directors. And then during the PGY 5, 6 years, we know the components of the training will include, as sort of mandated in the description, the clinic experience, the admitting service, an IC rotation, and then whatever uh, DR rotations are required to meet 
specific uh, uh, sort of uh, requirements to get your DR certification, both in nuclear medicine and mammography, and sort of whether if people can get those things done before they get to PGY-5-6, that'll be fine, but some of these they'll have to do. So you can see there's going to be a tremendous amount of collaboration, coordination uh, between the DR and the IR sides of this, uh, and it was really the intent, I can tell you, of the people putting together this program that there would be a tremendous amount of integration, not disintegration, as this goes forward. Uh, next slide. Things that we do know um, and some of the things that create probably the most anxiety are what will be happening with the fellowships and the one-year subspecialty fellowships will by necessity be either converted into IR programs that lead to an IRDR certificate or phased out if they don't do that and that is because the ABMS is charged with ensuring the public uh, that certification indicates a certain degree of uh, competency and they could not, did not want to have two different certificates for the same specialty, so they did not want to have a VIR subspecialty certificate and an IRDR specialty certificate uh, at the same time for any length of time. Now, they recognize that this could not happen overnight, and once everything is a Approved, and once the accreditations begin, there is estimated. Again, this is just an estimation, so don't take this as the absolute number, but likely between five and seven years during which this conversion process will take place. Could it happen Ooh. faster? It's potentially it could. Could it take longer? It's also the potential that it could. So until the program requirements are, are really out and we understand what structure we're going to be uh, dealing with, it's a little hard to give people uh, a prediction, but keep in mind that the ACGME and their RRC and radiology have a certain bandwidth in terms of how many programs they can accredit. These are new residencies, so they'll have to go through an accreditation process, so it, even that will just take some time. Next slide. So there are a, a lot of issues have been raised, and, and that's one of the reasons why the SIR created a, a task force um, to work on this, and really the, the goals of that task force are to try and identify as many of these issues and act as a resource for the RRC when necessary and also as a, a conduit for communication between all of the key parties that are, are involved in this. And a lot of the IR concerns are the timeline regarding fellowships, so program directors both in radiology and IR <coughs> are trying to understand what is going to happen to their particular program. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the <coughs> entry points in and out of this are also something people are very focused on, trying to understand, is this going to be uh, available only out of med school or will there be other entry points and also exit points for those people that will inevitably uh, change their mind once they start the training. So we're trying to sort of keep this... Uh, as flexible as possible, but this is really what's happening, you know, within the program committee. And we don't want to decrease the number of IRs. We're not trying to overwhelm the world or take over DR slots with this, but we certainly don't want to uh, lose um, any uh, output of our current uh, trainees. From the DR side, you can imagine uh, the impact on the DR residents and residencies is a tremendous concern, and we're very sensitive to this, and I think everybody is actually very concerned about this. We, DR is an integral part of this, and it needs to, we want it to thrive. Big programs are trying to understand how they'll deal with big fellowships coming out of big programs. Small programs are very concerned if they don't offer this, um, will it put them at a big disadvantage when it comes to attracting residents? And there are many excellent smaller DR or even mid-sized or even big DR residencies that don't have an IR fellowship right now. And so they're trying to understand what the uh, residents in R1 through 3 will actually be doing, their responsibilities as an area of concern. Uh, I can tell you it was from the people putting this together that these residents would be indistinguishable in all ways from DR residents. We'll, we'll wait to see what the, comes out of the writing group, but that was uh, the intent. Uh, and certainly how you 
the DR programs want to know how do you select people for this, well, how do they get in and out, just like the IR side uh, transfers uh, in order to avoid people leaving programs early or get, allowing people to get in when they want to get in. Next slide. So if you sort of think about who is uh, responsible for the various parts of this, uh, ACGME is, is focused on first the program structure and coming up with a, a workable program structure. Um, the, the certificate is going forward, that's the ABMS has determined that, and ACGME is now tasked with creating the program that will work, and then the accreditation part of that. The other organizations, SIR, APDR, APDR, SCARD, all of which are involved in this task force, are really trying to communicate and make sure that uh, people are aware of what's going on, that people are kept up to speed, and in, in a very positive way to identify strategies and tactics for how to bring this out so that once it's approved that the people have a lot of different options for how they might implement this. And, and we're thinking both about this at a financial and as, as an organizational uh, sort of levels. Um, and the last, the ABR, which is you know the, the sort of an actual you know, essential player in this, although at this point they're, they're not as involved with the sort of the day-to-day -day changes, but they will be examining and certifying people and recertifying people in, in the future. So the ABR has a lot of things and issues that it has to resolve and think about um, going forward as well. So you can see there are a lot, lot of different groups and a lot of different people all thinking about this. Uh, next slide. So really where we are now is that uh, it, this is kind of a unique thing. We created this unique uh, dual competency certificate in an, in an era in which ACGME is actually leaning away from uh, sort of dual programs. So it's, it's got to be its own uh, kind of training residency. But on the other hand, we don't want it to be so different and distinct in, uh, in uh, that it seems to be something completely outside of DR. The idea is that this will be within a DR department under the same chairman, but with two different program directors. Uh, it'll probably be about January when we see things. And again, it's, there are other forces. The ACGME has a lot of things going on, so there are other forces that uh, make January the likely time. But just remember that uh, what where we are is that IR is now a primary specialty in medicine, so there, there really are not a lot of those. Um, and IR is now recognized that way. The certificate that you'll get is an IRDR certificate, which will connote competency in interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology. So these individuals will have both of those competencies. They will be diagnostic radiologists. They will be interventional radiologists. And with that, I'll stop. Kyle, thank you very much for the opportunity. No, we really appreciate you. Uh, you uh, taking the time to put that together for all of us. Thank you. All right. Um, so next up, uh, we're going to have Dr. Um, Sahir Sabri, who is the Radiology Program Director at the University of Virginia. And for those of you who don't know, this is the program where the clinical pathway, which at least from the RFS standpoint, we're kind of recommending as like a good interim program, um, this is where that was developed. So um, I'm going to, Dr. Sabri, do you want to control your slides or would you like me to do it? Make sure I don't have him. Oh, and there we go. I have you muted. Sorry. Go ahead. You can do it. Okay. Bear with me. Open it up. And just a reminder to everyone who's called in, just double check that you are muted um, so that we don't hear your background noise during the presentation because it is slightly distracting. All right. Dr. Sabri, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Carl, for inviting me, and uh, it's great to, uh, uh, to be here and discuss this with you. Um, I'm a, the program director for um, radiology residency at UVA, and um, I'm also an interventional radiologist, so I have a vested interest in this. Uh, definitely, um, in the, I'm also an APDR member, Association of Program Directors in Radiology, and a, we have a newly formed <coughs> committee that is... Um, uh, formed by program directors, uh, head by Dr. McKinney, the head of APDR, um, with several members who are, some of us are interventional radiologists, some are, um, are not. And um, our goal is to, um, to give feedback to the SIR task force and then to RRC about um, the views of program directors in radiology about the implementation of the IRDR. Um, 
So I'm going to mostly talk about the clinical pathway that we have uh, at UVA um, for some time now. So next slide. So this uh, pathway is, is basically approved by the ABR and RSC as a re reorganization of training experience within the existing DR program requirements. So similar to the research pathway, um, so it did not re re you know, require a separate um, approval. This is just a reorganization of rotation within um, the uh, diagnostic radiology residency. Um, but you can uh, have a separate match number for me. You can match, you know, uh, medical students out of uh, out of the med school. So there's no need to have additional approval from HHME to initiate um, this at your institution. The direct pathway, on the other hand, um, was identified a separate pathway, and, and you just heard it before: three years of surgery and then four years of radiology, including IR. So, um, so this is separate, and uh, just to, to make sure there are two distinct uh, pathways. Next slide. So what we have at UVA, we have um, 10 residents a year, seven diagnostic re uh, residents, two VIR uh, clinical pathway. So I'm going to refer to it as a VIR pathway with a clinical pathway, probably interchangeably, and one research pathway resident. Then we have five fellows a year, uh, the PGY6, two go through the pathway, and three go through the um, IR match, so the so-called traditional pathway. So what we see here um, at UVA, we've been experiencing for some time since 2002, is probably what's, what we're going to be seeing in many uh, programs as the um, uh, IRDR um, starts and b before the phase out of the fellowships, we're going to have a mixture of residents who are coming through the, um, the pathway, the IRDR pathway, and residents who come to IR through the tr traditional pathway. And so we've been experiencing this, and we're going to you know, talk to you about how, how we've been um, doing that. So next slide. So the idea of the clinical pathways to enhance experience in, in the clinical diagnosis, pre- and post-procedure management of patients, um, so all diseases commonly encountered by IR, uh, provides stock diagnostic radiology, and that's very important that they need to uh, obtain certification in DR and practice diagnostic radiology, and allow them to participate in research. And you just heard um, earlier from um, Nikki that um, there's a lot of interest for medical students coming into radiology uh, they want to do research in IR, so we have to give the residents um, room to do that. Next slide. So um, we need to have a, this clinically oriented IR practice, which can adequately compete with other specialty, and that's the key of, of this pathway. And, and that's the key for the development of the IRDR is to make sure that um, uh, the IR, the interventional radiologists, are clinically savvy and can compete with other specialties. This was developed in 2000, and the first uh, trainee to graduate was Dr. Warren Sui, and you're going to be hearing from him a little bit. Um, the graduating trainees have pursued several um, or varying degrees of um, IR in their practice, some academic, some private practice, and some of them do 50% IR, up to 100% IR, so it's all over the map. Next slide. So the curriculum, I'm going to go over it a little bit. So this is a busy slide, I know, but this gives you a general idea of what they do now. Um, so basically, they do um, a year of um, surgical internship, then a diagnostic radio in the first in the first year, and then the PGY2 diagnostic radiology. Uh, they do an IR and an ICU month in the uh, PGY3 year, diagnostic radiology, IR for a month and a half, vascular surgery for two months, and then research for a month. PGY4 year, right before the um, core competency exam, they do mostly diagnostic radiology and only one month of IR. And then in the PGY five year, it's basically diagnostic radiology for three months, and it's mostly um, uh, breast and um, nuclear medicine. Um, and then six months of interventional radiology, the so-called mini fellowship. And then other clinical rotations, um, such as our clinic, um, you know, hepatology, GYN. And you're gonna hear from Dr. Kaj a little bit about his experience with these rotations. And, um, and another uh, research month. So this is this is the way it's done. And as you see, uh, and I'm going to compare it a little bit to the IRDR, that um, it has the clinical training throughout the residency. So that you're not uh, you don't do your internship then away from any clinical um, practice, and just mostly doing diagnostic radiology. I'm not saying the clinical practice meaning on the floors and doing uh, with other rotations and ICU and surgery and such, and then going back to the uh, to the fellowship. So this allows you to continue to do the um, 
uh, clinical aspect of it and, and um, uh, interacting with other specialties and working with them, such as surgery and cardiology and such. Next slide. So the overall experience is um, 18 months of, you know, so-called clinical, so basically 12 months of um, um, in the internship and then six months throughout. And by clinical, you mean uh, extensive patient interaction and, and no diagnostic radiology in it. Uh, 31 uh, months of diagnostic radiology, 10 months of IR, and then around, around two months of research, which can be increased based on electives. Um, and then you do your fellowship in, in um, IR at the end. Next slide. So this is just a general idea to give you um, how we uh, divide and experience the diagnostic radiology residents do it compared to the uh, pathway residents. Uh, and you see it's very comparable to many of them. They do similar breast imaging for endocrine medicine, but then they do a little s less notch float, you know, a little less of um, uh, neuroradiology and such. So this is, you know, just to give you an idea, they do a little less of everything, uh, and then instead they do more IR and then more clinical. All right, next slide. So who goes into the path path right now before you know the IRDR discussion started? So whenever the um, applicants came to us and talked to us about it, um, we always told them that the ones who are dedicated to a career in IR, they know for a fact. Um, as students, that's what they want to do. Um, so now we will just say, um, go to apply for the VR pathway. The ones who are undecided yet about IR, they think still think they're they may do this or may do other then we'll just tell them, you know, do the traditional pathway. Um, and as I said, the match program allows for separate match to, to both of these past pathways, so much of the research pathway. So, and this is the same thing that will be faced by all programs now coming in for the IRDR. Uh, when the from the five to seven years or so, what Dr. Kaufman is talking about, you're going to have students coming in and tell, you know, and ask about this, you know, I'm not sure about it. Do I need to do, uh, do go to the, a pathway or, the IRDR, or do I just go to the traditional path if it's still available? Um, but we know that after that, whatever that time is, there's not going to be a traditional pathway, so we're going to, you know, phase into this in the future. Next slide. So this is a um, what we think the IRDR is going to look like and comparing it to the current um, clinical pathway we have. Uh, the main difference you'll see is um, the clinical rotations that they are uh, more clinical rotations, PGY two to four, and then um, little, and then little less in the PGY five and six. So that's the main difference um, that's going to be um, there. And you know, we think that um, you know having these clinical rotations throughout, you don't lose um, you know touch with your um, um, so clinical skills, ICU skills, you know, being in surgery and such. Um, uh, you know, not losing that throughout. That'll be, that'll be a plus. And, um, and that's something that moving forward, um, hopefully we have several members uh, who are going to be on the RFC here with us um, today. I saw their names, Dr. Mezwa, Dr. Zidarni. So um, it's something that hopefully will be taken into account that to allow the programs within their means to, to have the residents do some clinical rotation throughout um, because we we found a great benefit from it. And you'll hear from Dr. Kazan and Dr. Sui about their experience and how that helped them in the um, um, in their in the fellowship, and then afterwards um, in the work in the workforce. Next slide. So from um, so that was the, these uh, slides are mostly talking uh, about our experience in IR, and this slide talks about um, us in the APDR, um, our you know committee of you know several discussions and thinking how we can help. Um, with these, there's several issues that were raised by program directors in radiology. Um, and just to let you know, I mean, funding is going to be a, a big issue. How to how to create these spots and um, where they're going to come from? Are they going to come from the diagnostic radiology residency? And so the residency will give up certain spots, so to speak, to the IRDR, or they're going to be separate funding for it, which is hard to get by these days. So these are issues that are going to be solved internally. And we'll see how, how will that be. And, and um, some of these issues which Dr. Kaufman mentioned, and they're definitely of concern to us as the, the you know, program directors in, in uh, radiology. The impact on diagnostic radiology training, are we going to lose some, um, some residents uh, to, to this? Um, you know, and the you know, coverage of, of rotations and such. Um, 
um, that, so that'll be an issue. Um, definitely, as an rent radiologist, we always worry about the graduation, graduating IRs. Is that number going to decrease? And Dr. Kaufman, you just, you just heard him saying that hopefully that's not going to be the case. But, you know, in a fellowship like ours, you know, a relatively large fellowship, five, um, it's unlikely we'll be able to have in the future, you know, five spots of IRDR when we have 10 residents. So that's not going to happen. So the fellowship is going to go down to three or four if the only way to do it is through the IRDR. Um, so if we only going to graduate three and every other big program is going to do the same, we hope that other programs that do not have an IR fellowship will, will start one. And, um, and that's an issue for many of these programs. That, that next point is the small programs that, or even the large programs that don't have a VR fellowship, how are they going to handle that? Are they going to be losing some of these residents? So um, we'll see how that's going to play out. And, you know, it's definitely hard for, for us to see that the, um, the fellowship, um, the traditional pathway is going to go away and um, how we're going to, you know, maintain the same number of, of IRs with, with that that way. That, that's going to be... Um, Tough to see, and then the next thing with the rules of transfer, I mean, you'll see Dr. Kaufman and I have the same issue, same problems, and I'm glad to see that they're trying to address these issues. So, as program directors, the transfer, I mean, um, if one way of doing it, um, the point of entry is not going to be through the med school, if many of it is going to be transferred between programs, I mean, as a program, I'm going to be losing a, a PGY-5 or PGY-4 resident at some point to go to another program to do their, um, to finish their IRDR. I mean, I'm expecting to be, you know, helping us with the call and such. So that's going to be tough for many programs. And how I mean, the rules of transfer is going to be some centralized way of doing it, similar to the MAC or so. So we'll see how that's going to be. So the last point I have is this, this phase out is going to be take a while. Uh, sorry, go back to this. Yeah, it's going to take a while. And it's going to be five to seven days as or so. And, uh, you know, it's. And, the, I, and we don't know when the RDR is going to start. I mean, as you saw, again, it's probably at least a couple of years down the road. And. And I recommend we've been talking about this to many uh, to many other program directors that it's probably it's a good idea to start working on a clinical pathway similar to this. The conversion is going to be very easy for us. It's going to be very easy um, if they don't allow us to do the clinical rotations throughout with the scansolate, and this becomes exactly RDR. But we already have that set up, and we have residents in it, and it's not a foreign um, concept. So. I encourage you to start such a pathway at your program, and then um, if you're a student or resident, I encourage you to talk to your program director about it. And uh, you can start that program, and then once the requirements are clear from the RRC, then you can easily convert it, because I think it's, it's going to be very close to, to what is out there. Um, but that's, that's a recommendation. We'll be happy to share our curriculum with anybody um, as we go. I think that was our my last slide. Next slide, I think. Is that all right? Yes, that's our next slide. And next, you're going to hear from Minhaj Kaja, who is um, who just graduated from from this pathway, and he is on his um, started his fellowship now. Um, I can't believe we let him out this early um, to come and talk today. So hopefully, he's still at the hospital. So um, so he's going to talk to you about his experience with the non-IR um, clinical rotations that he had and how important these were. Um, hopefully, to have a plug that we'll be allowed to do these in the new IRDL. Um, Minhaj, you can, uh, Kyle, I'll pass it to you so you can pass it to Minhaj. Thank you. Minhaj, do you want me to control your slides then? Sure, that's, that's sure. fine. Go ahead, man. Uh, so thank you uh, for having me speak here today. Um, so as Dr. Sabri mentioned, I'm a fellow at UVA and just finished uh, the BIR clinical pathway residency. I'm going to talk today a little bit about the non-IR clinical rotations. So I've put up uh, a few here. We, we have um, some experience in vascular surgery, our cardiology consult service, hepatology, dialysis access, and a vascular lab. In addition, we also do time um, uh, in the um, surgical and vascular ICU. Uh, and then separately, we have a IR outpatient clinic, which kind of goes to what Dr. Um, uh, Kaufman was mentioning as some of the requirements. Let's go to the next slide and kind of go through some of these experiences specifically. So the first um, is vascular surgery. So a lot of people are concerned about um, peripheral arterial disease and venous disease in interventional radiology training these days, but uh, I think that there's very strong hope for this. Um, at UVA, uh, we have a two-month rotation in vascular surgery in the uh, PGY uh, two year. When I started, it'll now be in the PGY three year. Um, you will be an ED, an inpatient consult resident as an upper level. So to keep in mind, uh, this plan is not that you are a um, 
interns have scudded out to do uh, to check labs and so on. So you're in the clinic every day uh, and you get consults and you are an additional resident on the team. You are not replacing a surgery resident. So you're there primarily to uh, see patients uh, in consultation and in clinic. Um, we're involved in all the new patient evaluations, both in clinic and uh, from the ER. And your role is to evaluate the patient, review the imaging, and formulate a treatment plan with the vascular surgery attendant, whether it's medical management, uh, surgical bypass or intervention, or if it's endovascular. And commonly, we've decided um, on patients that we've seen. I've looked at, uh, done their uh, H&P, felt their pulses, talked to them about their symptoms, reviewed the CTA with the uh, vascular surgery, attending in clinic without having an IR, having a vascular uh, imaging attending look at it. And, of course, we have questions. We have backup. Uh, we formulate the plan. Uh, and then at times, if we decided the patient is going to have endovascular treatment, I'd actually escort them down to IR so they get plugged in with our service. Um, during the process, participate in the evaluation of vascular lab stuff, so PVRs, ABIs, duplex scans, uh, which we, at least at UVA, do not really have much experience with as a diagnostic radiology resident as we have this peripheral vascular lab. So uh, another benefit of this is that we're really working hand in hand with the surgery residents. Um, and, you know, we work very closely with them on night float and while we're in IR, uh, but this gives them a different aspect. They see you as a clinician. They see you working hard, seeing patients with them, doing consults with them, rounding on patients. And, and that's uh, an important part of it that I'm going to talk a little bit more about. The next portion of this that's important is the dialysis access clinic. Uh, I know we do a lot of official work, and I'm sure that a lot of people do. Um, it can be a very large component of your practice, uh, whether in private practice or in ac uh, academia. And we, in this dialysis access clinic, work with a vascular surgeon and a uh, uh, dialysis access uh, specific surgeon. And we look at perioperative, preoperative evaluation, uh, management of complications, whether, again, if they're going to IR or if it's going to be a revision or sometimes, you know, you're planning the next uh, fistula or graft. And uh, it's a very nice experience because we're seeing the surgeon plan what they're going to do. Why is this patient getting a fistula? I know we have a national... Uh, official or first plan, but sometimes patients need a graft and why, you know, what is it that we're looking for? What is the size of the vessel? And they do their own duplex scanning uh, to evaluate the vas vasculature in the arm. So uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so again, on the same thing, we talk a lot about interventional oncology. And so we spend some time, month with hepatology, and it's very similar to uh, the vascular surgery rotation. Uh, this is actually an outpatient clinical rotation rather than an inpatient. Uh, and ED uh, rotation. But here you're seeing all of the patients that the hepatologists are seeing in clinic with their fellows, with their residents, um, and specifically separated out to see the patients who may require an intervention, such as TIPS, chemoembolization, or yttrium-90 uh, treatment. And again, in this process, you're evaluating the patients, you're reviewing imaging with the hepatology attending and fellows, and you're formulating a treatment plan, whether it be, uh, let's present them at tumor board, uh, this patient may, let's try some medical management to try to get the refractory ascites under control, or, you know, maybe this needs an interventional treatment. And so, again, you're working with the hepatologist, you're working with the fellows and residents who you'll be working with in the future, either as a trainee or as a, as a clinician in, uh, out in practice. Another very important rotation that we, uh, that we do is a one-month cardiology consult rotation. And this is similar vascular surgery, again, in that it's an ED and inpatient cardiology consult. You're on the team with internal medicine residents, medical students, and uh, and you're part of the team. And so you are seeing patients that are presenting with acute coronary syndrome, heart failures, and commonly that we see in the hospital setting, preoperative evaluation and risk stratification. All of these are very important to our subset of patients um, that are vasculopaths and uh, patients who are uh, have renal disease, things to that effect, and always looking to make sure we're doing the right thing for our patients. Are we uh, are we risk stratifying them? Do we need to do something before we do our EVAR or TVAR? Do we need to uh, plan that more appropriately? So these are all skills that are very important. Uh, also, EKG interpretation, we commonly run into that when we have patients with fistulae and they have abnormal lab values and hyperkalemia. We want to be able to evaluate even at least basic um, EKGs. One thing that's very important that I, uh, I really enjoyed in the cardiology consult is we all know that cardiologists are the essential uh, consultant physician. And just getting that experience from them uh, about how you do, how you work in a inpatient setting, whether in academic or private practice, as a consultant, your role, how you're supposed to, how your notes should be formulated, how you contact uh, the referring physicians, and how you make your recommendations. I don't know that we learned that um, as 
radiologists uh, and even as interventional radiologists where we're basically most of our work is consulting. So it's really important to get that experience. And we can go to the next slide. So overall, the benefits of just some of these examples are we improve your clinical experience in the evaluation of new patients, uh, plan, plan treatments, uh, and then follow up of these patients. Um, in addition, we, as I didn't mention specifically, was an IR clinic where we see our patients uh, pre-procedure and post-procedure. So we actually see how they're doing, manage their medications, take care of their pain, uh, make sure they're taking the right medication, and that they're plugged in with the right services that they may need, whether it's physical therapy or occupational therapy. Um, the next point is that this really establishes a strong relationship with the clinical services. Um, and it really is you're, you're forming a relationship with those trainees and those attendings that you work with every day who send you patients, and they know that you are capable of seeing patients and capable of taking care of their patients like they would want. Um, it's uh, skip to the last point is really it's marketing interventional radiology. Um, and another role that you play, which is great for your training as a diagnostic radiologist, is that you're a personal radiologist for that clinical team. You're seeing the patients uh, on rounds and you're looking at their imaging. A lot of times we have issues as diagnostic residents that we're, we're just seeing the films and we don't really know, you know, they say chest pain and we're seeing the films and it looks like there's no acute cardiopulmonary process. But when you see that patient in the, um, uh, on rounds or in the ER, it really adds to your experience as a radiologist. So um, as Kyle's going to the last slide, I just want to mention that overall that this pathway and the clinical experience you get kind of hits this three-prong approach where you're a strong diagnostic radiology resident um, by learning clinical components of your radiology. It also improves your technical procedural skills since you're spending all that time uh, on interventional radiology uh, working on your uh, skills. And then finally, it's an emphasis on clinical experience and uh, consultation. So again, thank you for having me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you, you talking about that because it's something that, as radiology residents, we, you know, if we're in a traditional pathway, we don't necessarily get any experience with. So thank you again for speaking, and hopefully we'll hear a little bit more from you at the end during the panel. Now, I, I realize that we're going a little long here, um, and I do apologize for that. Um, we started about five minutes late, um, but if you'll bear with us, I still want to make sure that uh, you guys stick around for the Q&A. It should happen in another 10 you know, probably actually closer to about seven minutes from now. So we just have two more brief speakers. Dr. Swee is going to present. Um, let me make sure he's unmuted. He was, uh, he is currently um, at uh, South Florida Vascular Associates. Um, he's a private practice attending in Florida, and um, he was the first UVA uh, clinical pathway graduate. So Dr. Swee, uh, I'll control your slides. Just bear with me. Okay. Hey, Kyle. How are you? Not too bad. Thanks for being here. Great. All right. Go uh, ahead. Willie, want to? Oh. Okay. Are right, you going to do a lot of clicking, but I'll, I'll give you a lot of click commands. And um, Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you uh, for having me. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for putting this together, and uh, uh, Joji, Vatican uh, and Cherry for helping to organize this, too. And it's nice to hear some familiar uh, voices in the prior speak, uh, speakers. Um, and I think it's – I'm really happy that there are medical students, residents, and program directors um, uh, tuning in today. And what I want to do is basically just tell you uh, my story now that I'm – about six years out uh, in the private practice world, which is which is really a doggy dog world out there. So let's do next slide. So basically, when I was in medical school, I was just plain confused. I thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, did some rotations and decided I hated that. I got a uh, tip from a family friend to try interventional radiology on a two-week uh, rotation down at University of Virginia. That's where I met uh, Alan Matsumoto and Fritz Angle, and I knew right away after that. Uh, rotation that this is that was it. I wanted to be an interventional radiologist. Um, Dr. Matsumoto said that they're going to try a new clinical pathway to introduce more clinical training. Uh, and he, he asked me if I wanted to uh, apply for it, and I was lucky enough to uh, actually match into that directly out of medical school. So we did a one-year internship in internal medicine. Uh, then I did the IR clinical pathway uh, as a resident and also as a fellow. Um, and I can tell you that it profoundly has changed uh, the decisions I've made and how um, I've progressed through my, my own uh, uh, professional career. So I stayed on uh, staff uh, at University of Virginia for one year. And then after that, I decided I was going to enter the private world. And um, this is where I think my training really caused me to uh, go in a different direction than perhaps uh, most do. Most people would uh, join a large uh, radiology practice as an interventional radiologist. Um, but I didn't want to do that because I felt uh, that uh, 
my diagnostic colleagues may hinder some of my, uh, my desires to really run a, a true clinical practice, which means rounding on patients in the hospital, running my own clinic. So instead, I joined a solo uh, independent uh, interventional radiologist, so he was broken off from radiology altogether. Uh, he had his own office, and he basically covered uh, a medium-sized hospital and did all of their interventional radiology. So it was perfect practice to join, and I felt comfortable joining that because I had that uh, clinical background, was able to see patients immediately um, on the wards and in the clinic. Um, we had a very strong practice with uh, peripheral arterial disease, cr uh, critical end ischemia, et cetera, um, and it's all because of that, that clinical model again. Then I left uh, Houston, and now I'm really stepping out of the box because I joined an, another practice uh, with a uh, solo uh, independent uh, uh, radiologist again broken off from radiology, but he has he had developed uh, an outpatient office based practice where he sees patients. But in the office, there's also an endovascular suite where he does procedures. <coughs> so we do about 90% of our procedures now uh, in the office, maybe 10% like triple A's and carotid stents in the hospital. So next slide, please. So that's where I work right now. It's an office. Next slide. Uh, this is our front reception area, next. Uh, this is the outdoor courtyard, next. You can just keep clicking and I'll keep talking here. Uh, that's an example of our uh, one of our endovascular suites. Uh, recovery area. Recovery area again. Uh, this is just a room where we talk to patients after procedures. This is our team of about 25 um, person staff, and then that's me on the right. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Julian in the middle, and Curtis Anderson's on the left. He just finished the UVA Clinical Pathway uh, Fellowship, and he just joined us two weeks ago. So uh, the types of things we do in our practice, chronic mesenteric ischemia, next. Uh, we treat popliteal aneurysms, next. Uterine artery embolization, next. Uh, we treat uh, critical ischemia, next. Uh, and we do uh, complicated, uh, you know, arterial disease cases. Most oh, again, most of in our office. About this IR residency stuff. I'm sorry. Oh, hello. Can't hear you. I'm muted. It's, you just log in. It's like a web link. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'll mute him, Doctor. Sweet. Just keep, just continue. Oh, okay. So, you know, the question is, how do, how do we do all this? How do we make this practice work, and where do we find our patients? It's all based on our clinical practice. So we see about 60 to 70 patients per week uh, that go through our clinic, and we sit down just like this, and we talk to them, we do their workup, et cetera. This is the foundation of, of what we do as interventional radiologists. Next. So here's interventional radiology, the surgery of the 21st century, and I think the traditional pathway really had it based on exceptional procedural competency and exceptional imaging competency. Next. But the question is, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Next. And I think it becomes pretty evident that we're missing clinical competency, and that's something that we really need to really need to work on. I think this is probably the most important slide um, that I have in my talk here. Next. So I just want to be a little explicit about clinical competency and what's important when you get out in the real world. What do you really, what does it mean? It means uh, you have clinical knowledge. You've got to understand disease processes and organ systems just as well as your competitors. Um, you've got to be able to make diagnosis, formulate uh, treatment plans, um, and then you've got to be able to open an office and run it. You've got to have a place where you can see new patient consultations, where you can follow up your patients after procedures, and where you can provide longitudinal care for the entire lifespan of a patient. Then in the hospital, you've got to be able to admit and manage your own patients. We've got to perform full consultations on every single procedure that every single patient or procedure uh, patient that you work with. You've got to round on your patients after procedures. You've got to manage your own complications, and you've got to be able to then direct your patients from the hospital back to your clinic again for follow-up and uh, long-term care. So this is what I mean by clinical competency. So what's the most important thing to me from the clinical pathway in terms of uh, you know developing good uh, clinical competency? I think it's continuity is really important. In medical school, we, do, we learn, you know, how to do H&Ps and evaluate patients. Internship, I mean, we're running floors and ICU wards, and then all of a sudden, boom, you go into radiology residency. It's a four-year blackout. And then all of a sudden, fellowship year, you're back. You've got to learn. You've got to relearn all your clinical skills, and you've got to learn procedures. It's just a very difficult thing to do. Whereas if you, if you have continuity of uh, clinical care uh, throughout your entire training, it's, it's much easier. Next, please. So I think if we are able to... 
um, get compensated in all three departments, we're going to make some really exceptional uh, interventional radiologists. Next. So uh, what's your real advantage? I think you come out, I know I came out, I had a certain confidence uh, that I felt that some of my other colleagues didn't have because I really felt like um, I could stand up next to any other specialty and, uh, and I, you know, I had that clinical knowledge to make decisions just as well as someone else. I think if you do the procedure and you take care of them uh, longitudinally, you're going to provide better care for that patient. You have autonomy because you don't rely on one single service to one single service to uh, feed you patients. Uh, you know, you, you've got your own office. You can compete. This is extremely important. The only way you can truly compete is to have your own office, market your own practice, um, and uh, have good communications with primary care uh, referrals. Um, you have new opportunities. Um, there's academics, and then there's the standard radiology group in private practice. But then uh, it allows you to break off and open your own independent uh, you know, interventional radiology group, or you might want to join a multi-specialty group. You've got the skills to do that. You gain a certain respect because people see you as a true clinician, a, a full, you know, full-fledged physician, and not just a technician. And I think all these things ultimately will, will, um, you know, serve to uh, provide more personal satisfaction. Next. So, in summary, I think the clinical pathway is a balanced curriculum that effectively meets the need for both clinical, procedural, and imaging uh, competency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sui, a lot for that uh, ex excellent presentation. Um, we just have a, a short, uh, about a minute and a half presentation here from um, uh, Dr. Rahul Nayar. Um, he is going to present uh, what I think is also an important aspect uh, if you're developing a clinical pathway is to be focusing on medical <laughs> student involvement early on. And um, I'm going to go ahead and share your slides, if that's all right, Rahul. Sure. Um, go ahead. Okay, so my name is Rahul Nayar. I'm a PGY4 at SUNY Upstate. Um, next, we could go to the next slide. So we just have, we've developed like a mini RFS here, which has kind of helped us um, be participate with the medical students as extensive as we are. Good next slide. So basically, well, how we have it broken down. All these talks have been excellent. Thanks so much, Kyle, again for setting this up. So what we want to do is give exposure to medical students, not when they're in their clinical years, in their third or fourth years, when they've already decided, but we're kind of focusing more on first years. So last year we got involved in the first year radiology course, which was offered as an elective, but since the um, students enjoyed it so much, it's now a mandatory class for all students. So four weeks of this course is dedicated to IR. So we give IR lectures, and then part of those four weeks, we also offer a central line clinic and a suturing clinic, which we take the medical students to the surgical skills lab and demonstrate how to get access, how to do exchange technique. So it kind of just gives them exposure early on. We can go to the next slide. So, and we also have a very strong IR interest group here, which hosts various lectures to kind of keep all the students interested. Next slide. So the main thing I wanted to talk about briefly is the practice of medicine class that we teach here. So this is a class for first and second years about history and physical skills examination. So this really allows us to show how IR has moved from a technical discipline to a truly clinical discipline. So we have to show them how to do a history and physical from head to toe. Um, next slide. And here, basically, what I do is I have a group of 20 first-year medical students who I meet every Tuesday afternoon. And here we talk about all the specialties, and here's where I could definitely pinpoint what the importance of the clinical interventionalist is and how the three distinguishing features of an IR from different specialties are that the diagnostic imaging perspective, the image-guided intervention, and the patient care. And this really allows students to kind of overcome that notion that radiologists aren't real clinicians, and students have a completely different outlook after participating in this class. And they really feel by pursuing IR, they could still be regarded as clinicians. Next slide. And then we have a third and fourth year elective, which we kind of build on what we do the first two years and keep the same students in the pipeline to give them exposure to IR. Next slide. And lastly, we have scholastic activities with the medical students as well as the residents interested in IR. We have monthly IR journal clubs. We have research projects that we link students up with the residents and we have extensive shadowing opportunities. So this basically allows us to keep in touch with the medical students for all four years and expose them to IR early on, which is going to be crucial, especially 
with these new pathways on the horizon. And that should be it. Thanks, Kyle. Right. Yeah, thank you very much, Rahul, for speaking. And um, uh, I think that's a very important point. I mean, we're going to be have to be recruiting medical students right as early as possible uh, with the ad, you know invention of this uh, new dual certificate. So it's something that can definitely be implemented by your interested uh, residents now. Something great for them to. Uh, to add to their CV and get you know get to work on and get those medical students interested. So thank you everyone for sticking around. Um, now we're going to do um, so a few minutes about questions. I've had a few questions uh, emailed in, and I'm going to put this slide back up. Um, bear with me. Um, if any of you th have thought of any questions during all these talks, go ahead and email them to me. I'm going to read a few of them for my panel, um, which I need to unmute all of them. All right. So the first question um, was from a uh, medical student who said, um, bear with me, if we start in a traditional program, uh, can we switch to a, a dual certificate um, after one year of diagnostic radiology? And um, Dr. Kaufman, I think you touched on this a little bit, but can you speak a little bit to that? Uh, what, what were, um, yeah, sure, Kyle. I just unmuted. So, yeah, you know, I think that's one of the things that everyone's thinking about um, until we understand a little better the program requirements, we'll, we'll uh, not really know how to answer that. Certainly the intent when it went to the ABMS was those first three years would have tremendous flexibility uh, because they would be identical. So uh, it, we'll just sort of wait and see. And I think the um, writing group uh, knows that, that that was uh, kind of what the idea was, but it depends on sort of the practicalities of it. But we're... Mm -hmm. we're certainly from the SIR task force side, hopeful that there would be a lot of flexibility like that. Mm -hmm. and anyone else on the panel, feel free to pipe up on these as well. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else to that question, um, I have a question here from uh, Mikhail who says, I'm a medical student interested in IR. Why is IR so fixated on staying connected with DR? Why not run like a surgical subspecialty, i.e. urology or neurosurgery? I don't see anything in common with DR, some, sure, some imaging skills, but way more in common with surgeons, clinics, patient contact, treatments, and most important, managing patient care with DR, which DR will have nothing to do with. So, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, so this is Sahar Sabri. So uh, I would say I would disagree with that. Um, in the practice that Dr. Sweet mentioned is it's not that common to see. Probably most of the ones who graduate in IR end up joining practices that are that are heavy in, in diagnostic radiology as well. So it, this is dictated by what the practices are out there, and I think um, that's what you're going to need to be. You are part of the diagnostic radiology uh, uh, department, you know, whether it's in academics. That's that's where interventional radiology sits. And that's where you're going to be part of, and, and as well as when you go out of practice, the majority of interventional radiologists are part of the diagnostic radiology group. Now, down the road, is it going to be many, many years down the road? Some, maybe more practice, like Dr. Sweet, will be where they're separate and running. That may be the case, and who knows what that holds in the future. There's definitely some who share the same views as you are. Um, I'm of the view that um, there's a huge advantage for, for being in that, and it's best for for everybody, it's a better training pathway for you. If you can do diagnostic radiology as well, it's easier to find, to find a job. Hey, Kyle, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, Dr. Swigan. So uh, I would actually think, I would actually say that uh, diagnostic radiology is still, you know, is essential to our training. It's, you know, I don't think we should really separate off. It is, it is uh, what, that's what we are. You know, we're we're still based in diagnostic radiology. That's that's the difference between us and and our competitors. So, if we can if we can do all things, have that exceptional, you know, diagnostic uh, radiology background. Again, the technical side and the clinical side. That's where you you really make a physician that special. Kyle, it's uh, John Cop. I could just take a quick crack at that. I mean, there. Are a couple of things to keep in mind. One, the, the image-guided interventions are based on imaging and being an expert at understanding imaging and particularly complex imaging as we go into an era where you may be doing simultaneous ultrasound, MR, CT-guided interventions with a functional component, having a very strong DR background is really going to be essential. Um, the You can 
sort of test yourself by asking a lot of different specialists who deal with liver tumors to look at an MR of the liver and come up with a sort of a treatment plan or an understanding of what they're looking at. And um, it, the interventional radiologists are going to have uh, the best grasp of not only what's on the MR but what the interventions are that uh, can be performed. The, the other thing to sort of keep in mind is that, uh, very simple, you are doing all these things under imaging guidance. So the more you understand about imaging, just the basic imaging, the better you're going to be able to do your procedures. So. Yeah, no, I, definitely that's an excellent point. Um, we, the questions have started rolling in now that the ball has, uh, <laughs> the ball has been pushed. Um, I have a question here. Um, for those of us interested in IR, this is from Ferris. Um, for those of us interested in IR, particularly in neurologic interventions, um, I'm curious whether neuro IR will or will not be integrated into current and future IR training paradigms. I think that's a great question. Well, I, a lot of silence, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody. I, knows. I got nothing for you. That's a question actually at the APDIR level. Um, mm -hmm. The the IR DR certificate does not include neuro interventions. That's because there is uh, there is a neuro interventional training pathway, and there aren't many, but there is an ACGME process for an INR fellowship. Most fellowships are not accredited at this moment. So that, that would really be a question to be answered by the APDR, the Association of Program Directors in Interventional Radiology, what their thinking is um, on this. Certainly, if you end up doing some neurointervention as part of your training, that's not going to be a problem. And from from what I've heard, there are you know select few programs that are still offering that, and generally it's a two year uh, two year fellowship, if not three. Um, uh, but it's not really being addressed by the dual certificate as of now, is what I'm hearing. Um, another question from Ryan. Um, Ryan Hag, uh, as these questions with the dual certificate unfold, will there be any changes for the people who are currently set to go into fellowship via the traditional pathway? No, there shouldn't be an issue. I mean, uh, as you heard, this is going to be it's going to be a while. Years, uh, five exactly. to seven years. So even for the residents entering now, they still the medical students entering residency now, they still have a chance with like to go into the traditional pathway. I think as the year, as the years go, that's going to be the tough decision in two to three years. Um, when somebody enter, when I enter from med school, like will I still have the chance to traditional pathway? And that's when it's going to become an issue. But next couple of years seems to be not going to be an issue since it's going to take that long for IRDR to start anyway. So right now, for all medical students, you can just you, you, there are not not a lot of pathways anyway out there. So there's a few programs that do it. So you just enter and. Residency as is, and and uh, go through the traditional pathway. Uh, Kyle, this I is, think, you know, go ahead. This is Kay Vitarini from. Um, I'm associate executive director of the ABR for diagnostic radiology, and just an answer to that last question: the plan of the ABR right now is to roll over the certificates that are IR subspecialty certificates into the new IRDR certificate, so that if somebody is in residency now and takes a fellowship, um, they would take a subspecialty certificate in IR prior to the beginning of the IRDR certificates, but that will eventually be rolled over to an IRDR certificate. Dr. Kaufman, did you have something to add? I was uh, hoping Kay was going to say something, so that was perfect. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, we've got a few more questions here, if you guys would bear with me. Um, uh, I just started, uh, this is from Steven uh, at Geisinger. I just started an R2 in a um, medium-sized DR program, which is not, did not have an IR fellowship, but a busy and growing IR practice. I'm in my last year and c completed an internal medicine residency and I'm board certified in GIM. I want to do IR. What pathway would you recommend for me to discuss with my program director and IR attendings? I would like to stay in the institution I'm in and work here when I'm finished. Um, well, I mean, at least from the RFS standpoint, um, you know, I think we've we've tried to underscore this that we, and Dr. Sabri has mentioned this as well, is that we think that there's probably a lot of parallels between the clinical pathway and what at least now the dual certificate is planned to look like. Um, you know, they kind of focus on the same one plus um, plus three plus two essentially um, 
layout. I mean, there's obviously going to be some differences, but it allows you to start thinking about setting your program up in that way and to kind of start identifying uh, residents early in, your, in their training that they're destined for IR. Now, I know that UVA has a, a direct match into that pathway, but many of the programs that have a clinical pathway do not. Um, my program at Ohio State, for example, it's, we identify residents who are interested in their second year at PGY2, and uh, we allow them to apply to the pathway that way. So um, that would be my recommendation. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's what, I, what I think probably needs to happen. And as you said, it doesn't have to be a match because some don't like to do that. Initially, they're not, as program directors, I'm talking. Um, it makes it a little harder to have a, have a different two two different matches and such. There's some complexity to it. So, um, so as you said, doing it that way, that's done in high school and other places. I did find residents after their first or second year, and then doing it that way. And the, the current curriculum allows a lot of flexibility. I mean, so it's a great way of doing it. It's just very natural uh, that the last year now is is mostly electives. Um, the bigger the program, the easier it is to, to do these uh, electives or mini fellowship or whatever the term is in the, in the um, fourth year of residency, the PGY five years. So uh, many can, 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 you know, get into a pathway of some sort um, in, your, in your training, in your second or third year, and then continue with that. Uh, and then, you know, so till IRDR starts, and then people can switch into IRDR. All right, a couple more questions. Um, this is from Chase. He's a third-year medical student uh, interested in IR. He said, when I match, will I still have to choose from the four options shown at the beginning? I really want to focus on IR. Um, if I really want to focus on IR, then do I need to look hard at the VIR programs over the other programs? And I would say um, that's part of our goal for the Training Pathways Committee is to database that information for you. And uh, it's available both on Ant Mini and Student Doctor, the programs that have disclosed to us that they have alternative options. So that's up to you, but uh, you know, our recommendation is to, uh, to pursue a program that goes above and beyond the traditional pathway so that you don't lose your clinical skills by the time uh, you go to your fellowship and you actually remember how to do those skills. Um, anyone else on that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, at SIR last year I met a lot of uh, students and residents, and I, I felt some anxiety about from people who said, well, I'm, I don't have this pathway where I, where I am or where I may be, may be going. Um, I think the key for, for the, you know, the the medical students and the residents is to be proactive and really, you know, just like you said, Kyle, you know, keep that clinical thought process going. Do your best to turn your electives into clinical rotations. You can really, I mean, in a sense, you can kind of do this on your own, um, but it's it's just really about being proactive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the current curriculum allows this, and that's something the residents now need to know. They can go to the program director and and ask for some of these electives in the last year to be to be as such, and not just IR. You're going to do a fellowship in it and try to get some clinical in your in your course year. I think that'll be that'll be ideal. So the, the current curriculum allows for this. Absolutely, and with the new board structure, um, I, I know that I used it as an opportunity to, at Ohio State. Um, to say, okay, look, um, we're going to have to re basically replace our existing rotations with clinical rotations if we don't restructure the curriculum, and we need to do it anyway to have everything done in time for boards. So why not uh, filter a few of electives into that board structure or into the, the, the pathway for all the residents, and then you can use those elective times for clinical electives. So this is a good entry to the next question, which is I wonder how some programs have approached other specialties regarding collaboration and participation for clinical rotations. And um, all, all, all we did was we sent an email to the program directors here. Uh, we said we have radiologists who are interested in actually, you know, being doctors again, and they were all they were all over it. Um, and uh, we do the same thing uh, that's done at UVA, which is um, that we are an extra resident on the service. So, um, you know, they are not relying on us to to do the grunt work. They're just they honestly just want to teach us, and we teach them a little bit about imaging as well. So, anyone else to that point? Yeah, I, I was I was the first. Uh, clinical guy over there so that was my job I, I just walked around the hospital and and uh and I went up to one of the cardiologists and I said hey do you mind if I if I just uh join your your service and the same thing with the hepatologists and the same thing with the vascular surgeons and they love having an extra body there quite honestly and they love having someone who's interested and who can who can read their films for them, for them. And, um you know just it's just a matter of of uh, getting out there and, and, and talking to people and asking and, and most of the time they'll be very receptive Okay. Um, 
it looks like we have four more questions. Uh, I'd like to wrap this up by 10 o'clock because um, I know it's getting yeah, it's 10 o'clock on the East Coast here, so I appreciate everyone sticking around. Um, this is from uh, Human Hennessy. Uh, I'm a PGY4 to traditional program that's planning on applying for IR fellowship. We have no clinical exposure and only three months IR requirement for graduation. I've taken the initiative to create my own rotations where I have one schedule uh, an endovascular surgery elective and two set up an IR elective in other institution where IR has huge emphasis on clinical practice. Any other suggestions? Um, I think there, are, if, if there is room in your schedule, I think hepatology, hepatobiliary surgery, oncology, medical or surgical are, are valuable uh, rotations in addition to what you've suggested. Cardiology has been suggested. Um, anything else? Um, there was a dialysis rotation at UVA as well. So. Um, those are the ones that have been covered so far, and uh, those are the ones I'd recommend. I'm going to move on, unless anyone has a specific added. Uh, is the medical student part of SIR working on generating activity with medical students about developing uh, SI student interest groups for IR? Vicki, and uh, I would say Nikki Zimmerman, you could probably talk to that effect. I can definitely answer that one. We are advocating very highly um, to create IR interest groups across the country. Um, we're tracking it right now. We're setting up a cookbook for our students as to how to create an IR uh, elective or, or uh, IR interest group at your school. We're creating a lecture series of 12 lectures on all of the fundamentals of IR and the biggest things that we do and distributing it across the country. And we're also helping set up IR electives for MS3s and MS4s so they can rotate to IR at other institutions if it's not offered at their school. So we're trying as hard as we can, and if your school doesn't have it, contact the Med Student Council, and we'll help you. Excellent. Um, Brandon Olivieri uh, says, a big barrier experienced by smaller programs when considering starting one of these programs is staffing the DR rotations, and I knew this question would come up. Although it is a larger program, I was wondering if there are any general methods that UVA use to staff their DR rotations when initially transitioning. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a tough issue, and uh, I think that's going to be the biggest obstacle for many programs uh, to deal with. Uh, it's not easy on our end. I mean, we, we had to, I mean, funding is the issue. Having ex We had to have extra spots and fund it, you know, not through the, um, like, GME and, and all, all the other federal dollars. So it's tough to, to, add, to, to, to have these residents move away from the diagnostic rotations. You have to have some sacrifices on the other end. So... Uh, that's going to be really hard, and smaller programs are going to be uh, going to be harder for them. So, being creative, um, you know, on some rotations that are somewhat lighter, you can do in the afternoon, you know, doing some uh, some work rather than just being done the whole the whole day. Um, you know, you know, one afternoon um, um, we have a, like a clinic; they do it uh, one Thursday afternoon out of rotation. It's easier than when you've done the whole time. At least you you have some experience. So. Uh, it's not that easy, and, a pro and not every program director believes that this is the way it should be done. And uh, um, so that's going to be uh, that's going to be tough um, uh, to do now and when the IRDR starts. But but these are some ideas of of not doing it the whole time. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to um, make. Go ahead. So I was just saying, in the diagnostic residency pro curriculum, you have elective time, whether it be a elective time on like something like neuro IR or your doing more PEDs electives and things like that. And in those spots, you can fill in um, and try to set up some sort of rotation, whether it's hepatology or cardiology or, you know, more IR or vascular or stuff, you know, you know, vascular. Those things can fit into the general uh, uh, elective time that you have. So that. Yeah, and and to replace to replace uh, rotations where necessary where the residents aren't necessarily carrying the brunt of the work. I agree. And something else I would say, uh, you know, being on, a, for example, I'm on a neuroradiology service that is extremely overworked um, at Ohio State, and uh, I am working very very hard to make sure that they don't hate me for having started a clinical pathway at this institution and taking residents off of their services. So um, I would say being a an ex a shining example of a hard worker when you're there on harder rotations is something that you want to strive for. So, um, it uh, here's a question from uh, Stephen Bonadrake: Is it poss possible to start a, a new IR fellowship now and transition into IRDR when the time comes? I would say um, probably yes, but Dr. Kaufman or Dr. Vitarini. Um, I'm understanding that question is kind of related to the other. If you do an IR fellowship now and then get a subspecialty certificate in IR, you will eventually have that certificate 
issue an IRDR certificate. Is that what the question was? I yeah, it may, it may be to that, but also is it worth the time and effort to put it to to start an IR fellowship with uh, only three to five or maybe seven years until the new certificate exists? I think may okay. have also been what that question was. This is not someone to take a fellowship and somebody to begin a fellowship in their institution. That was the way I understood it. Ah. Oh, I, no, I never, never mind. Uh, okay, so it's, it says, I meant can a fellowship program easily transition into an IR residency program? Um, what it, it will be like any other residency, a, a one will have to apply to become an IR, to have an IR residency, just like one has to, has to apply to ACGME to have a DR residency. So... Mm -hmm. And I, I, yeah, I think the structure of the residency is going to look very similar. Um, uh, or the fellowship and the sixth year of residency are going to look similar. So, yeah, if you want to put the time into, you know, putting in a fellowship in your program, I think it's reasonable, and basically it would just replace that. So um, it's it's just about 10 o'clock, and I notice a couple of people are straggling out, so I want to just have some final thoughts here. I'm sorry if I didn't get to the couple questions that were left. Um, so the, D, the dual certificate has excellent potential, but will take several years to become a reality. So starting a clinical pathway requires very little effort, no further approval from accrediting agencies, and can be designed to parallel the proposed dual certificate pathway. This will ease the administrative burden when the time comes to organize an IRDR residency and seek accreditation. So if you guys are interested in starting a pathway at your institution, whether it be clinical or otherwise, please contact um, the, uh, this email. It's the ir.training.pathways at gmail.com. That's for the Training Pathways Committee. And I'll leave this up. And we will send you information that we have, and we can provide individualized advice regarding how to um, make it a success at your program. Now, this was recorded, so it's going to be available on YouTube uh, eventually. So um, uh, we'll probably try and email that link out, that YouTube link out to everybody uh, that we originally reached, um, and hopefully you guys can watch it again if you missed anything. So um, I want to thank the panel very much for being here and de dedicating their time and staying after a half hour, um, but I think it was really useful. Um, and uh, I hope you all have a have a great night. Have a great night, Kyle, and everyone else. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, Kyle. Oh, it was a great session. Thanks for organizing. Anybody who Anybody wants to ask wants specific questions, I'll stick around um, for a few minutes um, and try and, and then try and speak to them as people log out. So feel free. Um, you can, uh, if you want to me to unmute you, then just ask me. Um, hey Nasser, um, yes. Uh, the, he, uh, for those of you who are still in here, he asked, "Is there any initiative from SIR or the APDIR to programs that have a direct pathway to avoid closing their programs?" And uh, Nasser, that's one of the jobs of the pathway um, committee that's kind of been pushed off to the side because of this webinar. But we are drafting a, uh, a response to that, and uh, we're planning on um, encouraging that via an email to the APDR and APDIR to. Um, you know, based in, we may even link this particular talk and say, you know, look, we're talking five five years probably at the minimum. And on an individual note, any program that has said that they're planning on getting rid of their their direct pathway to to the committee, um, I've uh, given them a mild slap on the wrist and said that you know, realistically, we're talking several years here, and we don't want to leave students without options um, in the next few years. Uh, and I had recent and pretty decent response from that. So. Um, Dara Wright um, asking, why are direct programs closing? I think that's because many programs are, have um, uh, they've heard about this dual certificate being approved by the ABMS, and they're essentially um, thinking that that means that it's going to be any day now, uh, and they don't understand the administrative overhead in which you know what it takes really to make this happen. So, as you saw, the number of arrows on Dr. Kaufman's slide is not exactly a simple process. Anyone else? Okay, I can answer individual questions by email. I'm going to go ahead and close up shop tonight, but uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending, and uh, have a good one.